All right, good morning, good day, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, it truly is a pleasure and honor to be invited back again, and thank you, Juan, Rod, and the SSF team for inviting me to what's probably the best master course in lateral surgery. And you guys have done an amazing job getting everybody together. So without much ado, what is pre sewers It essentially is exactly that, an approach in front of the sewers. So you avoid going through the service and rather go in front of it. And so what that means is you're going to approach the disc obliquely rather than directly down. And it has as little nuances that we'll talk about quickly in terms of what pre-service is. But bottom line, it's following anatomical corridors that actually exist between tissue planes. And it's very similar to the ACDF. I keep seeing it every talk of mine. We do ACDF next to the carotid to the spine every day. And this is really no different. It's an approach in front of the aorta or lateral to the aorta in front of the psoas in that tissue plane that we're sort of used to. So something to think about when you're accessing it and it's a natural plane to get into. And so the biggest thing we do is how to access it, right? To study the MRI. Now in this particular case, a three, four year clean access between the psoas and the aorta. Similarly, you go down to four, five though now, the Iota is split and so is the IVC. The, that internal, that IVC left iliac is trying to sneak under the aorta. One millimeter down, it's in your plane. You really couldn't do a pre service approach here. This for me would be in the bifurcation in the lateral position like an a lift, but in the lateral position. So that's how we really look at, am I going in the bifurcation or lateral to the aorta? Five one clearly will be in the bifurcation. So this patient will get a two level A lift in the lateral position, followed by a lateral pre service at the other levels. So all done in the lateral position, just studying the bifurcation anatomical planes we have afforded. So you don't dissect or move the vessels around pretty much at all. And that's what MIS is all about. So this case, if you look at it, we can get three, four, we can get four, five, and we can get five, one in a pre service plane. So this is a segmentation, obviously, probably a, a sacralized phi one, allowing you access to get there. So just study the vessels, you have a plane, and we use the plane. That's what pre service is, and, and using anatomical plates. So our incisions are this, the bottom one is a phi one incision, the middle one usually is for me for four, five, three, four, and many a time two, three, and the very top one for one, two, if you're doing all five levels, all in the lateral position. So just quickly a video through the approach. This will be an incision for two, three, three, four, four, five. It's an inch incision. I a number of videos, I think, that explain most of it. And if you take this and you go down the external oblique and you split it, I'm just going to go a little faster for one of time. You basically split the external oblique. I usually use my finger. And there's a lot of finger dissection here. I think it's safe and clean. There's the external oblique that's opened up. You then go down to the next layer, which obviously is internal oblique splitting the internal oblique there, again, in its plane. Now my fingers through the transfer phallus into the retroperitoneal space, reach for it in the back, sweep everything off and move the retroperitoneal space and the contents anteriorly. You'll feel the psoas right below. It's a huge muscle that goes along the tube milli, it's unmistakable. And you just sweep everything off that psoas with your finger as best as you can. You then can feel the aorta in most patients the left internal iliac. My fingers right on it, just like you feel the carotid on ACDF. Retractor goes right over it, finger comes out. My retroperitoneal contents, or sorry, peritoneal contents are all behind that retractor. The next retractor is above the psoas. Do not retract the psoas. You just retract the contents above the psoas. So now you see the psoas literally staring at you. Once you've got that, have somebody hold that sponge stick, clean all the soft tissue in front of the psoas. So you have direct visualization to what you're seeing. You see the contents, make sure nothing is there, identify the disc space, and then the endoscopic peanuts really useful here to clean that area in front of the psoas. See where your probe is going to. I can't emphasize this more. Look where the probe is going. Place it on the disc, get an x-ray, and you know where you are, and that ascertains your position. Even the tube, now you put your light source in, and even the tube we pass down on the direct vision. 
So you pass the tube, the dilating tubes down. It doesn't matter what system you're using. Pass all the dilating tubes under direct vision. You're looking at it. It's in front of the psoas. You know exactly where it is. The tubes go down, put it in place. The other retractors come out. Your tube is now the retractor. And you basically have taken everything else out. You stare you look right in front of the psoas on the disk space. The guide wire is there to tell you where you are. And you're literally at this point staring at the disk. Make sure again, there's nothing in your plane before you make your incision. So identify the disk, the white of the disk should stare at you. You know that's disk and there's nothing there. At that point, you take your knife and do your annulotomy to do your obviously access. The annulotomy is probably the most important part of this entire procedure where you go in and you actually do the, do, I'm gonna pass this video now, where you actually get disc access. And this is where you see the disc clearly, there's nothing there. I like to see the ALL and many a times I put an anterior blade to make sure it's there. This doesn't have to go all the way, but it gives me tremendous uh, uh, sort of confidence that I'm in the right spot. And you're seeing the ALL, you want to be just, at least I like to put it just behind the ALL. So I'm in the anterior third of the intervertebral space. Eventually, my annulotomy is just behind that. We use a small carb, followed by a large carb. And the other key maneuver here, to see how it's entering obliquely right now? You enter the disk space under direct vision. Make sure your sagittal orientation on x-ray is right. At this point, you have to go orthogonal to make it pass into the disc at 90 degrees. So you'll see me go posterior. So if you're gonna do this technique, you want the posterior, you do not want a posterior blade. You actually can't do this with a posterior blade there. So we're using a three-bladed retractor system, spin it around so that blade is anterior. And then now you're orthogonal to the disc. And after this, it really is a regular discectomy that I think we've all done in lateral approaches. And at this point, as long as you remember these maneuvers, it is then preparing the disc sequentially as we do, you know, put your devices in, do your, I mean, do your discectomy, get your trials, open it up. But every time I'm looking at that ALL, so I know where I am anatomically, rather than just rely on X-ray, you see the ALL, you know it's intact, you're just behind it, prepare the end plates as you will with the tools you have, you know, scrape out the, obviously the cartilage as best as you can, clean out everything there, and then, and then get to uh, what you want to do, prepare the disc, as well as the trials, and the trials then go in, and before I turn my screen freezes, let me go to the next one. So once the trials start going and you dilate it, the other key thing I always said is, increase height before you get lordosis. I think it's a terrible mistake to get lordosis before height, but otherwise you'll kink it over and actually create stenosis posteriorly. So if you want indirect reduction, create height first that gives you indirect reduction. And hopefully I can get off this uh, spinning wheel. Uh, and, um, oh, there we go, good. Let me go back one touch. So that's just a collage of um, just x-rays showing access going in. This is what I talk about, get a height before you get, you have to see that lift. It's really important, make sure that thing lifts up. You know you didn't damage the end plate, you know you got height reduction, you know you got indirect reduction. In fact, it's almost getting some core now with indirect reduction. If you did not lift that body up and get height restoration, you're probably not going to get indirect reduction. I know it's a strong statement, but think about it and see for yourself and I think that's important and, and you can do that. So that's important. Um, and, and then the new technologies today, uh, this has been really useful for us. This is a camera that we're using right on the retractor itself. It's really helped me teach everybody what's going on. Everyone can see what's happening and I can see what the fellow or resident is doing. So train them through it and it doesn't come in your way. So it's actually been very useful and two, I can actually now go and look at a screen and operate and actually it's changing a lot of things, including magnification of how much you can see. And again, back to see what you're doing and where you're putting all your instruments 
And I do believe that will make things a little easier in at least avoiding problems. So complications, everything on earth has been published for this. I caution you, these are oblique lateral approaches that many of them were literally many open or thoracic abdominal approaches. When you actually look at it, it's not what we're doing today. A lot of them are just pretty much many open thoracic abdominal approaches. So be careful when you read, every single thing is down there. I think we've come a long way from this. And this is actually directly from a paper on the oblique lateral approach, which to me looks like a total thoracic abdominal approach. But if we can get to what's like an ACDF of the lumbar spine, I think we're looking at a different thing. Do not manipulate it. As I said, everything, this is a great paper I like a lot from Japan, from the national database. They did not look at anti service actually. They were just looking at laterals, but it turned out there are a large number to compare between trans service and pre service And interestingly, you can see the difference is obviously in nerve injuries, far less with the pre service and, and far less of the other, except they did have a little more of peritoneal lacerations with the pre service while in their learning curve. Well, the next slide will tell you their learning curve. They also saw that institutions who had done more than 100 cases really dropped their complication rate significantly with the pre service as opposed to trans service. And that itself was interesting. So, and I think that, that, that almost reflects close to our experience too. You look at a good 50 to 100 cases to really get comfortable in this or any of these approaches for that matter. And, and, and it's a safe approach when you get to do it that way. This is our paper. We looked at our old, before when we went trans service and then moved to pre service about nine years ago. And I think the biggest issue is quadriceps palsies and the neuropraxias that we were getting. Uh, hopefully it's almost, it really is zero right now and no quadriceps palsies so far to date. And it's really made it comfortable and convenient. We published this, we're looking at all the uh, pre service approaches uh, across the board. There's been good restoration of lordosis as well as good functional outcomes. And in terms of issues, we had one segment lottery injury and one urethral lottery early on in 2013. Since, but no sympathetic bowel, renal, lumbar plexopathy is even transient or permanent. So you're able to see where you are and do a surgical dissection to where you need to be. So at the end of the day, use your corridor, minimally expose anything or even mobilize the great vessels. Yeah, that's important. Directly visualize the path of your probe. I cannot overemphasize that and your dilator, see the ALL if you can, it gives you better confidence as to where you are, confirm an X-ray, and then be prepared to go orthogonal. Don't forget, you gotta straighten your device to get 90 degrees to the disc, and I think you'll be in a safe place to do this particular approach. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about L5S1? Um, and obviously, when you're doing L4-5, L5S1, I think the levels, um, can you give the uh, uh, audience and the participants just some advice on, you know, let's say on your first 10 um, L5S1s, we're using a vascular surgeon, a general surgeon. Um, can you give us some advice on, you know, how do you, when you're first starting out, obviously, uh, you have a lot of experience doing this, but what are some tips and tricks for um, dealing with L5-S1 and L4-5, Neil? All right, all right. thanks for asking. I, I specifically didn't put 5-1 and focus only on 2-5. to five. But yes, 5-1 is really a different approach in the bifurcation, in the lateral position. So the first thing is the vascular surgeon. If you, and, and we use a vascular surgeon for exposure only because if there's a problem, I'd rather he be there repairing it. And two, I think the reason I said vascular surgeon is it's really important they are comfortable exposing now an ALIF approach in the lateral position. So I think that's your first step. Get your vascular surgeon comfortable in that. Once he's able to get you access, I, I keep saying this, it really is an ALIF, ALIF, ALIF we did every single day, except you're looking at it in a different plane. Mm -hmm. Instruments are the same, exact device, everything's the same. So it really comes to that exposure, and I kind of would emphasize how much the vascular surgeon is important in that, in getting it, and, and some of them get it right away, and it makes it easier. Uh, we usually, and the other thing that's been good for us is, I'm not dependent on the vascular surgeon's timing. Patients in lateral position, 
and I give them a window between seven to 10 to show up. They're rather busy doing other cases too. So if they're not here, I do my four, five, expose it, get to four, five, do what I'm doing, or three, four. And when they show up, they do five, one when they're there. The incision is different. I use a separate incision for five, one and four, five. I just find it very easy, but five, one is way out in the front. Five, one's more in the middle between the ASIS and sort of the umbilical midline, about two, I'd say about two inches in front of the ASIS. Whereas I can take four five right next to the front of the disc. So I keep that separate rather than one big incision. Uh, so like I said, I do five one separate, four five three four two three separate. And so, yeah, but I, I'd say vascular surgeon is important. And then it's orientation. It's literally one case. For those who have done O lifts a lot, uh, sorry, A lifts a lot, you switch within a case to this. And it's just about orientation and direction then. Great, thanks, Neil. 